This meeting is being recorded. A very warm welcome to everyone joining the webinar. We'll just give a few seconds for folks to come in. It's wonderful to have you with us and greetings from Stockholm. I see we have participants from all around the world. Thank you for joining. A very warm welcome. We'll start on time. Um, my name is Helena. I'm your moderator for the next hour and a half, uh, which will go past very, very quickly because we have a fantastic topic. Uh, I'm the Director General of Consumers International. It's my absolute pleasure to be talking to you from Stockholm, where, of course, uh, the meeting that's called Stockholm Plus 50 is taking place during uh, this week. It commemorates uh, the event that took place 50 years ago. Uh, the first UN conference on the human environment. And at that point, uh, environmental protection was unfortunately a fairly new uh, topic. Some countries even pushed back on having that conference in the first place to make sure that the environment and its impact on us all uh, was on the agenda. Now, 50 years later, thankfully, um, we recognize that we need to take action um, we recognize that we need to accelerate every possible intervention point if we are to uh, reach net zero. As Consumers International and a member organization of 200 consumer advocate uh, organizations around the world, we called for a fast, a fair and an accountable transition for uh, people everywhere. Here, um, we are bringing together a fantastic set of experts who are going to be talking about how we create a consumer powered transition, how we uh, you leverage technologies uh, to make that happen and how we reach our targets in many different ways. Let's face it, the size of the consumption challenge, which is trillions of products produced in millions of locations and sold to billions of consumers demands ambitious action. We will hear from one of the lead authors of the sixth assessment report, which showed that 40 to 70 percent of future greenhouse gas emissions reductions could be achieved by demand side interventions. Those are about us as consumers. At the same time, consumers are becoming increasingly aware of the need for change. Uh, the recent GlobeSat scan survey across 17 countries showed that more than 60 percent of respondents considered climate change to be a very serious problem. And yet our awareness, our, the affordability of sustainable products, our access to them needs to be increased. SDG 12, which is the sustainable development goal on creating a uh, future economic model, which is based on sustainable consumption and production, remains one of the most neglected by policymakers. By 2020, only 82 countries had developed, or adopted, or implemented policy instruments um, to support the shift to that new economic model. So we need to speed up. In this discussion, we are going to hear from those who are thinking about the role, the responsibility of consumers, the way in which we can protect and empower consumers for that transition. We are going to dig down into the specifics of e-commerce in particular. I am thrilled to welcome uh, a, a set of experts who you can see, those of you who are able to see the screen can see uh, we have representation from the United Nations, uh, from national governments, uh, from experts and academics, and also from consumer advocates from around the world. And they are going to share their perspectives and how we move forward. So without further ado, I am thrilled to welcome Joyashri Roy uh, to share her perspectives uh, first and foremost. Joyashri is the Banga Bandhu Chair Professor at the Asian Institute of Technology in Thailand. She is also a Professor of Economics at Jadavpur University. And of course, she was the coordinating lead for the IPCC uh, sixth assessment report with a specific focus on that chapter on demand led uh, strategies. Um, she is among the network of scientists who shared 
in the 2007 Nobel Peace uh, Prize awarded to the IPCC. Um, and she, it's wonderful to have you here, Joy Ashri, because you crucially acknowledge the role um, of consumers uh, for the first time in the uh, work that you launched earlier this year. I'd love it if we could call on you uh, to share with us the contribution that demand side that consumers, that we as people in the marketplace can and should make to climate change mitigation, and perhaps point to some of the trigger points and actions that can really shift the system as a whole. Joy Ashri, the, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much for uh, arranging this. I think this could not have been much better than anyone else who organizing this. So this is, I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you very much. So what I would like to share with you is that on 4th of April this year, the new report on climate change mitigation in six assessment cycle of IPCC is published. And this new report, as you know, was an effort of 278 scientists from 65 countries who volunteered their personal time to get this scientific report written for the benefit of humanity at large. The very clear message is that unless there are immediate and deep emissions reductions across all sectors, 1.5 degrees Celsius is beyond reach and projected nationally determined contributions announced prior to COP26 shows warming will exceed 1.5 degree and it will make it harder to limit warming after 2030 to below two degrees Celsius. Human influence has warmed the climate at a rate that is unprecedented, at least in the last 2000 years. It is well understood scientifically now, climate change is not a threat to GDP of an economy, but a serious threat to health of the planet and human well-being. However, the good news coming out of this report is that in every sector, there are options available now that can at least halve emission by 2030 and keep open the possibility of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. This third report focuses on what we can do to stop climate change, how to reduce the amount of warming gases that are emitted every day from human activities. But this also needs to be clarified that IPCC does not prescribe any particular action. They provide the scientific analysis based on robust evidence and the countries, regions, investors, institutions, individuals have the freedom to prioritize their actions in line with global goal. A paradigm shift on the way we think about climate action is reported for the first time in this IPCC report through its first ever chapter on demand services and social aspects of mitigation, which puts well-being of the people at the center while mitigating climate change, while assessing social science literature on what motivates people to take action, it was very clear that people want services to meet their needs for well-being, be it through technology adoption, accessing new infrastructure, behavior change, or socio-cultural practice change or lifestyle change. For the first time in concrete measurable terms, so we could find that at least 40 to 70% of 2050 levels of projected emission can be reduced by working on the demand side without making people worse off in their well-being dimensions, employment generation. What it implies is instead of putting the burden of emission reduction completely on energy supply sector alone, demand side measures can realize the untapped potential of 40 to 70% reduction. We evaluated 60 such options and uh, presented in the report with their mitigation potential. Let me just say some of these options for the benefit uh, rather than giving the large laundry list. First we saw it is the waste reduction, the highest emission reduction potential exists, be it in food, energy, and materials. It can be through social practice or social norm change, technological improvement, efficiency gain. Well, what we try to say is 
uh, it is not only market price which can change human behavior, but for example, how in restaurants, one can be provided with an option to have smaller plates rather than one big plate option. How can eateries use various app apps to send surplus food at the end of the day to food bank for redistribution rather than throwing in the garbage beans. Still, if there are waste that can be used for composting by waste recycling units, stores need to revisit their labeling scientifically and manage food handling based on the date of expiry and take required action to avoid waste. Similar examples are there for material recycling process, reduction in virgin material use in industrial supply chain. Second, I would say overall demand reduction can be achieved in multiple ways. For example, depends on how you deliver service. Comfortable, secure public transport system can reduce congestion in cities and take away stress of driving and still provide access to schools, jobs, railway stations, airports. Need for flying can reduce because of advancement of digital technology, which takes away fatigue of frequent long distance travel, gets work done, provide more leisure time. A walkable city and bicycle lanes provide scope for better maintenance of health and access to all that we need. Better presentation of options of healthy balanced diet help reducing meat consumption to nutritional level and enhance consumption of plants, nuts, fruits based on sustainable products. So basically we are saying we do need norms, policies that help food planners choice architects, city planners, investors to plan better and help people to make better choices for their own health and the environment in which they breathe and get the right temperature to live comfortably. Digital technology, time of use pricing, information of usage pattern of electricity compared to your neighbor can make demand flexible and reduce need for setting up of newer power plants. In cold, and, in cold and warm countries, room temperature can be managed better through default setting by avoiding overheating and overcooling, which also has health implications. In this whole process, we find that employment in multiple sectors in new service provision can increase, new granular advanced technology innovation can help shape demand in future, we do need designers and choice architects to present choices that help in making better choices by the consumers. But providing at user level access to more efficient energy conversion technologies, the need for primary energy can be reduced by 45% by 2050 compared to 2020. While there is mitigation potential in many regions of the world, we need to keep in mind in some places, people still require additional housing, energy and resources for human well-being. The lowest 25% of population globally shown by income category faces shortfalls in shelter, mobility and nutrition. Inequity has been in the heart of this report. The IPCC report also show individuals with high socioeconomic status contribute disproportionately to emissions and have the highest potential for emission reduction as citizens, investors, consumers, role models, and professionals. Those with high economic status, high income, or high education have the highest capacity to act and bear higher responsibility. Evidence shows wealthy people have high potential for emission reduction and can become social influencers. The report shows that they are capable of reducing their greenhouse gases by becoming role models for low carbon lifestyles, investing in low carbon business and advocating for stringent climate policies. If we classify people by their consumption levels, we know now very clearly that consumption of top 1% contribute 15% and consumption of top 10% contribute 37% of the emissions. So consumption of the bottom 90% people contribute less than half of the global GHG emissions to be precise 48%. So if we classify people by income groups globally, the richest 10% households contribute 40% 
uh, 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 to be precise, 34 to 45% of global emissions. Bottom 50%, less than 15%. So information, presenting choices better, and scientifically help bringing structural change that translates into lifestyle change, challenging the way we currently live. Policymakers, investors, businesses, and multiple institutions like what I see here today, who shape consumer choices have the responsibility to actively manage the change. I'll just stop here now and can come back later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for, for covering those examples. Um, it's about what we eat, what we buy, how we plug in, how we heat and cool, how we save and spend, how we travel. But there are different, there is, there are different responsibilities and different actions um, depending on uh, where we are and who we are. Um, but I think you're bringing through that systemic need for change. You know, the, the, leaving this to individual consumers can be a tricky business, as we may hear next. Um, thank you so much. And thank you for uh, devoting in this first, for this first time, uh, a chapter in the IPCC report on the demand side. And I hope we can uh, lean into that and, and see that develop uh, much more in the future. With that, I'd love now to turn to those who think, uh, breathe, work day in, day out on um, the, the realities of consumer protection uh, and empowerment and how they lean into this question. First, I'd love to come to Dr. Christiane Rohleder. Uh, Dr. Rohleder is, of course, she's a German lawyer She's a political uh, figure. Uh, she's been state, state secretary at the federal ministry, and this is where I need to read out because there's many pieces in this, for the environment, nature protection, nuclear safety, and consumer protection. That combination is uh, fantastic since December 2021. She's also a member of the supervisory board of the GIZ, uh, which is the German Society for the, the International Cooperation. Um, before this, uh, uh, Dr. Rolader was the State Se Secretary in the Ministry for Family, Women, Youth, Integration and Consumer Protection in the Rhineland Palatinate, um, and so has a deep and long experience of how to bring people into the marketplace and make sure that they are protected and uh, empowered at the same time. Uh, Dr. Rolader, I'd love to hear from you uh, the main risks and opportunities from the consumer perspective in this era of a green transition? And how do we, how do we move towards those changes uh, that Dr. Roy laid out at the start of this uh, discussion? Thank you very much um, for the kind int uh, introduction and uh, oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roy, for your um, very interesting um, findings um, sharing this here. Thank you for, for that. How to bring about a green uh, digital consumer power recovery? This is an extremely important question because we can only tackle the climate crisis together with consumers. In recent weeks, the main focus has been on tackling acute crisis. Our top priority at the moment is to stop Russia's military aggression against the Ukraine, which we condemn in the strongest possible terms. The war is having devastating consequences for the people of Ukraine. At the same time, consumers worldwide are feeling the effects of this war and of the COVID-19 pandemic at the same time. Supply chains from Shanghai and elsewhere has been, have been disrupted. The war in Ukraine has also led to grain shortages. And in the global south, there's a serious risk of hunger crisis. That's why we first have to try to mitigate the consequences this has for consumers worldwide. Consumer protection policymakers in many countries are now dealing with price increases and their direct social impacts. Thus, consumer policy is always synonymous also with social policy, especially in these difficult times. We have to give special consideration to vulnerable and socially disadvantaged consumers. Um, this also showed, uh, was uh, very impressing the figures um, from, by Dr. Roy, which people so, um, have which impact on the greenhouse gases. 
However, beyond the, uh, these direct financial concerns, we cannot afford to lose sight of the major challenges associated with the climate crisis. With the recent heat waves, people in India are experiencing firsthand the consequences of the climate crisis. In Germany, we were painfully reminded of this with the floods last year in which many lives were tragically lost. This has made clear to us once again that we need to find solutions here and to find it fast. The window of opportunity for us to keep the Earth from overheating and prevent the devastating consequences this will have also for consumers is closing fast. It's therefore all the more important that we discuss the opportunities offered by the necessary transition. If we move towards a green economy and adopt climate-friendly and resources-efficient business practices, then our economy will be more resilient to crisis and less dependent on fossil fuels. That is why in Germany we have interlinked consumer and environmental protection more closely and put the two policies under one roof. This allows us to leverage the power of consumers to tackle greenhouse gas emissions. Consumer behavior has a huge influence on greenhouse gas emissions. Consumption of private households accounts for a quarter of all emissions. The German government's goal is to halve consumption-related greenhouse gas emissions per capita in Germany by 2030. To get consumers on board as we move towards a green economy, it is crucial that we make it easier for consumers to make sustainable choices. From the very beginning, products should be designed to be more sustainable, more durable, and easily repaired. Products should also contain recycled materials and be recyclable. We therefore support the proposal of the European Commission set out its sustainable product initiative, which aims to create the corresponding product requirements. Under the EU Eco-Design Directive, we are working to establish rules to ensure that devices like smartphones and tablets are not thrown out after a short time just because a battery cannot be replaced or updates or spare parts are not available. It is also paramount that consumers are informed as best as possible and can actively shape the green transition. For example, the energy and resource consumption of digital technologies depends greatly on the software used. That's why our government also offers the Blue Angel Eco label for software products to highlight minimum requirements and create transparency. Digital technologies can play an important role in informing consumers also. A digital product passport, for instance, can provide information on the product components, materials used, repairability and proper disposal. Using a QR code, consumers can see at a glance which mobile phone model can be easily be repaired and what garment contains recycled fibers. This will enable consumers to make really informed choices. Better, easily accessible information is all at the heart of the European Commission's proposal for a directive on empowering consumers for the green transition. The directive is intended to ensure consumers are protected against misleading environmental claims, in other words, greenwashing. This is something the German government supports with an app called Siegelklarheit, which means label clarity. Using the app, consumers can simply scan a product label while out shopping and immediately find out how reliable the label is and whether they can trust it. Furthermore, in Germany, we have uh, developed an online calculator which everyone can use to calculate the, their carbon footprint in just a few simple steps and get tips on how to improve it. If we want digital technologies to benefit the green transition, we have to simultaneously ensure that digital products and services are fair, transparent and secure and the consumers can trust them. In the EU, this is reflected in the General Data Protection Regulation and the Digital Services Act. Under the Act, platforms offering digital services will in future have to assume greater responsibility and misleading practices will be banned. This is very important for consumers' trust in digital technologies. And it's 
only with this trust that we can really take advantage of the wide range of digital possibilities for the green transition. Our supply chains are global and the digital transition is presenting people worldwide with major changes. That's why consumer protection like environmental protection should not stop at national borders. I'm therefore delighted that Consumers International is collecting ideas from all around the globe and making sure they gain widespread recognition. There's an old saying that goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. To reach our goals, we need to do both. We have to go fast, which means we need the outstanding ideas of individuals, but we also have to go far, which is why we need to share these ideas in order to move forward together. This is what makes this discussion here today so important. So thank you for making this exchange possible and thank you very much for your attention. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, set the right targets, set hard targets, make it accountable, make it easy for people to be able to be part of this transition. Let's use technology uh, to, to, towards the green transition. And you brought over this sort of systemic approach of consumer, power, consumer protection and empowerment uh, that goes all the way around uh, the economy. Thank you so much. Um, now let's take this to a global level with Isabelle Durand. Uh, Madame Durand, you became the Deputy Secretary General at UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, where of course uh, member states hold the guidelines on consumer policy for around the world. Um, you uh, entered that role in 2017. Um, Isabel has contributed to making international cooperation, to making consumer policy, to making sustainable consumption a reality um, in that institution. Uh, she's really led uh, the work uh, throughout, of course, the pandemic, kept it on, high on the agenda through incredible crises for, for consumers, um, including you know, finance, technology, travel, even investment, sustainable development. Um, of course, prior to UNCTAD, uh, Madame Durand was um, uh, act acting secretary general and then is, of course, a former uh, deputy prime minister in Belgium um, and vice president of the European Parliament. Um, Madame Durand, if I can ask, is this uh, set of uh, um, interventions shared across the world? How do we increase international cooperation to bring the demand side strategies into the equation? How, how does, uh, and how do consumer advocates help you in that, uh, in that endeavor? Thank you, Elena, and uh, happy to be with you today. Uh, it's true that your question is a big question. And I first of all would like to react to what I just heard because it's very interesting to make the link between what was just said and how in UNCTAD we try to really internationalize the discussion on protection of consumer. And it's true that uh, I, I heard a lot from IPCC and I was very happy to listen to that about the climate mitigation and how it can, it can be organized. I just would like as not representative, but be the voice of developing countries that we don't have to, to forget the adaptation issue. Because for a lot of developing countries, the question of mitigation is less, uh, less important or less a, 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 a lower priority for them. The first issue is adaptation because they are affected and impacted by climate change. No, not for the next generation. And of course, there is a lot of consequences that they have to address. And adaptation means also money for that, especially after the COVID, after the debt crisis for a lot of them. And in addition, what just uh, Christian already said about the Ukrainian crisis and the, the war in Ukraine and all the consequences of energy, energy price, uh, energy costs, and all issues related to uh, food insecurity in some countries. So for them, the priority is adaptation, first of all. And it's true that we have to, to, to keep that in mind. Secondly, I agree with the fact that we have to get the consumer on board. And I fully agree with all what was said and the new rules on European level regarding uh, labelization, information for the consumers, etc. For sure. 
But you have also to know, and I, I am the voice of uh, maybe those who are a little bit less uh, informed or less involved, for a lot of companies, and especially SMEs, which are the backbone of the recovery, for them, the standard labelization certification, it has a cost and a high cost. And it means that for them, they are excluded from this new uh, green market or, or, or more sustainable market, which is totally unfair because they have to be part of, of that. And not only fair trade as a niche, but fair trade has to become the model for all of us. So there is a problem when we multiply in developed countries the certification and the capacity to have access to the markets for the, the for the developing countries and the, the the SMEs from developing countries, we create a new gap and a new unfair approach for them because they are not able to pay for this certification. So that's also something that we have to keep in mind. Uh, thirdly, and I agree with that, um, poor people or poor community have to be part of the consumer approach, the new consumer approach. It's not, not fair to, to think that just uh, the, the, the richest or the more informed uh, consumer are able to be part of the transition. And I use this expression in the, in the international consumer discussion two years ago. I think that consumer, and it's better in French, Les consommateurs doivent devenir des consommateurs. I don't know in, in English, maybe it's less, uh, but I think that yes, be part of the discussion, be part of the action, not only as a consumer uh, purchasing products, but also as a citizen. And it's true that there is no reason that people in developing world would be excluded from this perspective because they can. Of course, we have to take into account what I just said regarding their capacity and the, 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 the first priority for them. Thirdly, uh, you know that it's not easy to organize an international discussion on that because we are not exactly on the same level of uh, priorities. Nevertheless, uh, in the UN system, and UNCTAD is really engaged in that, we try to organize through the guiding principle of the UN on protection of consumer to develop this kind of approach everywhere in every country, for every community. And I think that the role of the, the organizations uh, on protection of consumer is of course important because a consumer cannot be just identified as an individual person. They need also to be supported in their action, which is not only buy products, but it's also influence the market, influence the production system, influence the, the transition. And to do that, we need organization uh, as international consumer, but not, not only this one, all the organization on the ground to really reflect and reveal which are the specificities of their countries and how it, can to, it has to be addressed. And it's not the same in the EU or I don't know where um, in Ghana or, or I don't know where in Asia. So it's true that we have really to look at that and trying to have um, more organization working on the ground in all countries and trying to coordinate their action. We are trying to, or to coordinate um, the government approach, but a uh, consumer internationalist member of E-Trade for All initiative, which is a way that's on the digital aspect, not only climate, but digital aspect. And I finish with that. It's true that the digital aspect, the digital divide is of course very, very uh, uh, important. And we have seen with the pandemic how the, the digital readiness is important and how it helps uh, citizens, consumers, but also companies or entrepreneurs to stay on board. But also all who were, were not connected or not connected, well connected were left behind through this crisis. And it's why this uh, digital divide has to be combat uh, 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 everywhere, every uh, uh, through every means, in order to to allow not only uh, for developing versus developed countries, because this gap is also within countries, between the rural and urban areas, between generation, between a lot of people having access, or just not only have access but be actor in the digital world. It means that uh, uh, we have also to help to, and to combat the, the concentration of power of the big platforms and trying to really help the, the, the government, the citizens, the companies to understand the business model of the digital economy, which is totally different as the 
usual one or the, the previous one. And if they understand the, the, the business model, the question of data, which is key, it's the new, a new global value chain and trying to use, of course, with all the privacy issue, which have to be protected uh, for protection of citizens and protection of consumer. But there is a lot of misuse, a lot of misinformation, a lot of not knowing well how it works and how you can protect yourself, your kids, your family uh, against uh, misusing, which is also key in the developing uh, of uh, the, digit the, the digital economy in order that the digital economy helps and support a sustainable development. And uh, I, th I, 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 I think that a lot has had to be done in order to understand, not only to the connection, connection is important, but literacy, capacity to understand the system, trying to develop their own, in the developing world, their own products, their own project through, to, through their own platform and not just be victim or client of the biggest one. That's really the challenge for e-commerce. And it's why there are big discussion in the, in the WTO just now on this issue, which is very, very sensitive for a lot of for transnational, transnational uh, e-commerce or digital activities. So I stop here, but I think that we have always to take in, uh, in, in, in mind the fact that inequalities are permanent. And in this world, if all people everywhere would like to have a better uh, uh, approach and, uh, on climate change and would like to have a sustainable uh, and, and just transition, it has to be just. Socially, it has to be just. Otherwise, it will never work. And it will be two words between the rich one or the developed one and the others, which will not solve the problem of 1.5 degrees or two or three. Uh, it's true that it's not just only at national or even at regional level. We have to look at that globally. But globally means also to take into consideration half of the world totally with a totally different approach uh, of this issue, those two issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now that was fantastic. And uh, this is the emphasis on why consumer protection is so important, right? You know, when we talk about demand side strategies, it would be so easy just to assume, well, we just give people information. It, you know, we will empower people. It will, you know, let, let's let that work. Let's create opportunities. Let's use digital technologies. But this needs to work for all or it will break down. How do we make sure that's with and not just at. Um, so thank you so much for that. And also for being a great partner for Consumers International to allow us to bring the voice of uh, independent consumers into the United Nations system. Um, very pertinently, one of our speakers, uh, Rose Pofu, uh, who is the executive director um, in Zimbabwe, uh, we've heard she's not able to join because she's out in uh, her country talking about digital finance uh, with consumers there and doesn't have connectivity. I, I'd like to flag, you know, consume, the Consumer Council of Zimbabwe drafted the Consumer Protection Act for the country, which only just came into, uh, into uh, play in 2019. So the importance of consumer advocacy, the importance of access, and the importance of uh, making sure that we're, we're um, moving uh, forward for all. Um, however, I think we're going to see if um, uh, one of our members um, uh, who's on the line, because we have those from all around the world, if we're able to have a representative to join us in place, because consumer advocates are always ready. However, I'm thrilled um, that we have uh, members of Consumers International from uh, Sweden, from Malaysia, from Hong Kong, actually in our next generation community here to react. And just very briefly, Jan, if I can come to you as our host here in, uh, from Sveriges Consumenta, um, how do you react to hearing Dr. Roy's comments about demand side and what's the role of consumer advocacy in helping us accelerate? Yes, thank you very much, Helena, and thank you very much for two very interesting, uh, three very interesting <laughs> interventions. Um, we are the Swedish Consumer Association, and we have 19 member organizations. We are an um, umbrella organization, and I must say that the we we can see a change in our role that we we have a unique role in this necessary transition that that we have because we have to be a part of doing this as been stated by uh, 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 you, um, 
make it work for all, uh, all consumer. You you always uh, you, you quite often say that talk about the, the consumers as one unified group, one homo homogen group. Um, so it must work. It must be easy. The sustainable choice must be easy and affordable to ev everybody. That's our motto very much. And we can see as a consumer movement that we have a unique role to actually make this transition fair and also understandable that let's see people can see where we're heading and that we're heading to a good place <laughs> so to speak it's more healthier and they must see the vision and we have a role to actually paint out that vision then when it comes to what the consumers can do and 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 the role of consumer empowerment uh, consumer empowerment is very important but it's not enough and uh, it's very easy to, so to speak, daydream about in information and what it can do. But you have to be, it has to be put, supported by strong and brave political action. And also front runners within the business that see that they can just not lean back and wait for the demand side to be very loud, loud and vocal. There must be front runner and, and uh, come out of the comfort zone. But, but we strongly um, emphasize the role of the politicians and the policymakers that they should really make, create a platform or create uh, an environment for all consumers so that they can take the responsibility that they are willing to take. Wonderful, thank you. And if I could come to Kelsen in Hong Kong, um, your reaction as a as a next generation consumer advocate? Yeah, um, I definitely agree that um, consumer organizations are, are important, and it's not just about voicing for consumer, but also educating consumer, especially the young the young generation. Of course, uh, when we receive education, since we we were we were young, we know about the fact of climate change, global warming, etc. But sometimes the issue may sound too far from us, not, 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 not touching our everyday lives. That's why people do not necessarily take action, even though they know about the fact. So I think as consumer organization, it is important for them to educate their consumer the seriousness, the seriousness of the issue, as well as the action they can take to tackle the issues. For example, uh, as Professor Roy just mentioned, uh, you know, she gave us so many examples, such as um, uh, uh, having the option of smaller portion when, when you order food in restaurant and also food bank for redistribution, walkable city. I think some of these examples are actually doable, not just on, you know, you know, on organizational level, but also on individual consumer level. So I think uh, consumer, uh, you know, just in uh, consumer organization could just help give such kind of tips to consumer to let them uh, just, you know, realize it in their everyday lives. I think that would be a very important action that, uh, you know, uh, this kind of organization should do. And then briefly, let's see, um, Chimera, thank you so much for joining. Um, Chimera is, of course, from uh, Consent in Uganda. Let's see. Yes, wonderful. Would love your reaction uh, to what you've heard from uh, the speakers so far. What is the role of consumer advocacy in helping with this transition. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a great honor joining in and listening in to the voices uh, that come in from the global world with regards to issues of sustainability. Uh, we will appreciate that uh, what is affecting the global world and all that colleagues have shared with their rich experience really affects not only the Europe or the developed world, it also affects the developing world. The levels of information, uh, the gap of information affects quite a lot. And it is very important as consumer advocates to get the rich messages and the experiences that our colleagues have shared and we localize them localize them in that 
uh, consumers, like say in Uganda or Africa, appreciate uh, the challenges that are faced with the developed world need to be uh, uh, localized in that as we crave for development as consumers in the developing world, everything now is revolving around the same goods and services. Uh, if they are sustainable, they will be in position to be sustainable wherever they are supplied. There is a need also to preach the reduction of the good and services print, um, empowering uh, uh, consumers in the developing world to package information, in particular to engage the youth because they are the majority and they do drive the demand. Uh, when you look at the digital goods and services, when you look at the needs of the young consumers are, are driving production, they are driving marketing. So once we empower the generation, the young generation, they will be in position to help turn around the, uh, the challenges that we are facing. Uh, we, the parents of the young generation, we end up following the demand, the needs of the young generation. So this is why I find that there is, it is very important for us to empower them. Like our colleague in Hong Kong has just said, we will need to do a lot of advocacy, even the policy makers to put them into focus and make sure that whatever policy, regulations, rules, and uh, guidance they bring about is in line with all aspects of sustainability. That's what I could share, but I would like to thank the putting up all this and coming up with systems that will empower consumers to act more sustainably. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you for helping us by leaping on here to ensure that the continent is represented on this call. Um, as always, wonderful to have you with us. If you wouldn't mind staying, um, yes. it would be fantastic to have your reaction to the next section as well. Um, Paul, I, I would love I, if you would like to add to any of what you have heard from your fellow consumer advocates. It's about information. It's about information that's relevant to the next generation, but we have to make the system support that. It's not just information. Um, you know, we can't leave people to, to just be on their own. Policymakers must lean in and consumer advocates can drive that. Anything that we've missed in that story as we react to what we heard from the IPCC? We are talking about the role of consumer organizations. Yes. Yeah, I, I think uh, there are two things here, Helena. One is the policy level and one is the empowerment level. Now, sometimes there is no policy and this is where we learn from, you know, from these experiences to inform and develop policies. But sometimes there are a lot of good statements, you know, but these statements are not translated into, and that's the advocacy that consumer organizations can play more specifically. For example, if we talk of equal labeling, what is it that can learn from others that is more practical in our own country? Because this may be missing. You know? And the third aspect is, of course, we have to put pressure. I mean, we have to play our role in changing consumer behavior because we represent. And we have to facilitate the systems, but we also have to educate and mold behavior towards that. I think I have to play both the policy and the empowerment role. You know? so that's my view. Excellent. So it's keeping that pressure on between yeah, the consumers and the system that should support them. Thank you so much. So with this, Elena, um, yes. Yeah, Elena, just uh, if I can, you, act, you asked us to, to be dynamic and interactive. I just want to, 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 to react to what was just said. And I think that probably everywhere, the work the, 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 between organization, advocacy organization and the parliament, sometimes we are neglecting the parliament. It's a place where it depends uh, of course, of, uh, of but I think that it's really a place that the, the, this organization have to really uh, contact, uh, trying to put up on pressure 
on the members of the parliament with advocacy. I think that government is one thing. And when, when I heard, of course, that a lot of policies are not implemented, <laughs> a good statement, but not implementation, I think that the control of the implementation can be done uh, on a way which has to be adapted to the local um, uh, issues, but the parliament has to be on a way or another involved in this control of implementation of the rules or the advocacy, just. That's a great point. And Jan, yeah, please. Yeah, just to add two, two short points about we, we in the consumer movement have now a very big challenge actually to combine the, the skyrocketing of costs with the message that we have to continue with the transition, with with the green transition, and that's really a challenge, I, I, I think. And and we also have a challenge, and an, uh, a task to uh, mobilize and to challenge ordinary or normal, so to speak, consumer patterns. Uh, or we we are very influenced by by advertising and marketing, and and uh, what is a sound level, what, what, what is sound and sustainable consumption. Thank you. And Joy Ashley, please go ahead. Yeah, I would say two things uh, hearing this, you know, that um, uh, in our report, it was very clear that in case of say, uh, dietary choice, it's more sociocultural factors, individual preferences, choices, how choices are presented to them, they matter a lot. Of course, technology matters, recycling matters, whether they are available or not, but the uh, biggest uh, emission reduction really comes from the sociocultural factors and making them aware of what is healthy uh, and nutritious uh, diet. So those are the things. But in, in case of, say, for example, uh, uh, when people want to want a walkable city, I think the consumers forum can have a very important role um, influencing the investors and the policymaker that the need they want a walkable city. It's just not high speed trains, high speed buses. So there is a need for this, um, I mean, uh, and comfortable buses, those are needed, right? So this is something which is very important. So this kind of demand can shift, bring in the more structural shift. And that we have seen in case of buildings, in infrastructure, in urban settlement design, all these things have very important role to play, how you design the infrastructure. So these are very important things that we really need to look into. We should not look into in one clubbed uh, things, but then we need to see them with their specificity and different consumer groups can advocate on different things. That's a great point. I think it's the that getting that demand, but getting that demand sufficiently loud and also uh, overcoming the barriers for that demand to be heard and for that demand to be put in place is actually um, uh, something that we could spend a lot more time talking on here. Why don't we dig into a specific case and e explore that? Um, for this particular um, uh, conversation, we have been looking at an example of you know, how we bring digital and green and consumers together, which is e-commerce. Now, e-commerce has grown extraordinarily, of course, driven by the pandemic. Um, an estimated 2.3 billion people will shop online in 2022, this year. Um, the feeling is that these shifts uh, are here to stay. Um, an UNCTAD, study in 2020 found that most people expected at that point to stay online. And I think we're seeing that. Um, E-commerce should be you know, one of the ways in which we might be able to hear more and learn more and act more uh, with technical to, technolo technology um, towards our sustainability goals. How do we make that the case? And we've been looking uh, with the fantastic help of experts at the uh, IISD, IISD, the International um, uh, Institute for Sustainable Development, um, at what needs to happen to make that the case. 
Now, first, my colleague uh, Oliver Bealby Wright is going to share what uh, has come out of that to that exploration to date, and then um, Natalie Benasconi Osterwalder, who is a senior, uh, excuse me, ex executive director at ISD, um, will be elaborating on that. Uh, Oliver, can I pass the the floor to you? Thanks very much, Helena, and it's a real privilege uh, to be following on from such brilliant interventions to say, look, this is one trigger uh, and this is one pathway uh, for reaching those demand side uh, decarbonisation targets. So we started the Green Commerce Project uh, to reach our vision of a future online marketplace and it has three parts. It needs to be free of greenwashing. Information doesn't work whilst there are misleading green claims on the market. Consumers need access to comprehensive and standardised product sustainability information. So we've heard how information isn't always enough, but if it's comparable and gives a holistic picture of a product, it's got the best chance of moving consumer behaviors. And we're also interested in the way that e-commerce can support consumers to make sustainable choices. So not just raw transparency alone, but using the online choice architecture in a responsible and consumer friendly way uh, to really empower the consumer in sustainable consumption. So we're very proud to have partnered with the International Institute for Sustainable Development uh, to map pathways for policymakers to transform the sustainability information provided to online consumers. And you can see some of the journey, uh, which we are uh, coming towards the end of. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the next steps uh, at the end of this presentation. So I'm gonna talk you through, if it'll let me change the slide, there we go. Uh, five core actions for policymakers, followed by three supplementary actions. So the reason that we have this is that the five core actions will directly affect the provision of product sustainability information to consumers. Uh, some of them may apply to offline commerce as well as e-commerce, but we've tried to look at how can you apply that specifically to the operating model of e-commerce, which as Isabel pointed out, is very, very different from traditional commerce and raises a whole different set of consumer protection uh, and enforcement issues. Uh, so we'll be going through those core actions, but our research did also find uh, that these actions will only be successful if there are certain enabling conditions. So we have three supporting actions, which will create those conditions and together those eight actions uh, represent a more holistic, whole system approach uh, to this transformation built on consumer protection and empowerment principles. So to start, and I'll go through these quickly uh, so we have as much time as possible uh, for our great panel of consumer advocates uh, to give their thoughts uh, on these actions. But the first that we've been seeing a trend uh, towards setting requirements for the provision of product sustainability information. So in many countries, there are already information requirements uh, for provision of information to consumers. Uh, this is very important given the structural asymmetry in the market between the seller and the consumer and the importance of transparency to uh, mitigate that. And now some policymakers in parts of the world, and we've already heard a little bit from Christiane about what's happening in Europe, uh, are looking at ways uh, to do that for sustainability. We're setting out uh, the methods that you need to take if you're a policymaker uh, to achieve that. And we think we can break it down into three parts. The first is deciding the scope. Are you looking at information requirements by product category or cross-cutting? The second is the elements. So what uh, sustainability attributes are gonna be required uh, to be disclosed to consumers? And then method, how? How will that be calculated? How will that be assessed? And then how will it be communicated? Two examples will help to explain uh, how we're looking at this. The European Commission proposal for uh, eco-design, uh, which was published uh, a couple of months ago, uh, is a really interesting one because it includes in it uh, potentially horizontal legislation uh, that will be cross-cutting uh, across different product categories and apply to all products sold uh, in the EU single market. The elements included uh, will be uh, mainly to do with product life, life cycle, uh, sorry, lifetime uh, 
aspects. And the method is interesting, and it's what Christian talks about, which is a digital product passport, uh, which can allow all value chain actors as well as consumers and also regulators uh, to access that key information uh, in a digitally streamlined way. The second example to highlight is France's climate and resilience law from last year, uh, which focuses on specific product categories which are listed there uh, and uses a method of uh, life cycle analysis, which is uh, being piloted and uh, experimented with at the moment in a participatory process, uh, which will give quantitative, holistic information uh, to consumers uh, that uh, incorporates the aspects listed there. The second policy action is specifically looking at e-commerce and the complexity of its operating model is that it's really important for policymakers to allocate responsibilities for communicating product sustainability information. So, at the very minimum, manufacturers, sellers, and e-commerce platforms need to know where they stand in terms of uh, green claims legislation uh, and their liabilities for information, but also in the context of setting mandatory information requirements. And it's very complex because there are lots of different actions that need to be set up. There's the measurement, the collection, the assessment, the verification, and then the presentation of information. And we've been looking at what Chile have done uh, in their recent electronic commerce uh, regulation, which came into force this March, uh, and the way that they, for example, set intermediary requirements for information sharing, for example, between third party sellers and e-commerce platforms. And those are the kind of questions that will need to be answered uh, on sustainability information going forwards. Thirdly, and I'll speed up, information alone is not enough. We need to encourage behaviors. And We've done a synthesis of a lot of behavioral science uh, and consumer perception data on this. Uh, and there are lots of ways to explain the so-called intention action gap on sustainability. There are rational trade-offs that consumers make. Uh, if, for example, sustainable products are getting more expensive, as Jan pointed out, uh, they may prioritize other factors other than sustainability. And consumer knowledge and trust has a part to play too. But there are also situational factors and uh, embedded habits which um, influence consumer behaviours. And these are likely to be even more intense in e-commerce where, for example, uh, predefined consumer profiles and AI-generated recommendations shorten the consumer journey and so increasing time pressure on consumers. And they also run the risk of locking consumers into previous unsustainable shopping habits. Having said that, e-commerce has several advantages. It has unlimited digital shelf space, which isn't to say that consumers have unlimited patience. Information overload is another risk, uh, but we have identified uh, through our stakeholder consultations three proven interventions uh, that we think help uh, to have transparency that works to shift behaviors and genuinely alters the online choice architecture in a way that empowers consumers. That's layering information, animating information, for example, through an infographic and standardizing information. Platforms have a huge role to play as gatekeepers to the marketplace, to ensuring that third party sellers, for example, provide information on sustainability in a standardized, uh, easily comparable way. Action four is on eco labels. I'm gonna draw out two of the pieces um, from these policy options. Eco labels are extremely powerful and concise tool uh, to convey sustainability characteristics of products to consumers. They're often rated uh, by con in consumer surveys the most trusted uh, information tool. However, there are concerns around uh, the verification systems in some schemes and regulators have a role to play here. For example, by establishing minimum government governance requirements uh, for eco-labels and also by establishing a public accreditation scheme for eco-labeling bodies, which would really guarantee that the practices of verif verification behind eco-labels are watertight for consumers. Which brings us on to our final core action, which is combating misleading claims. And this is a real priority for two main reasons. The first, an essential consumer right is at risk. Greenwashing is out of control. Uh, an ice pen uh, global sweep of websites last year found that four in 10 online green claims could be misleading. Uh, the right to adequate information is enshrined in uh, the 
uh, UN guidelines for consumer protection and uh, law, consumer law often in many places incorporates uh, uh, rules against misleading uh, claims to consumers. Greenwashing also breeds skepticism. Uh, a recent survey showed that 60% of consumers have lost trust in the sustainability information provided to them by companies. And that's creating uh, a disengagement which lets down the companies who are doing the right thing and presenting information in the right way. Policymakers can act. They can look at different models uh, for regulating green claims, for example, in a pre-approval procedure for this, which may be feasible in some contexts. They can create stricter rules by banning the use of certain terms, which are de facto greenwashing. For example, climate neutral, which is a controversial one, and impact free or environmentally friendly, which is very difficult to substantiate in practice. And consumer authorities have an important play, role to play here. For example, by providing detailed rules and guidance for businesses on how to make green claims in a way that complies with consumer law on unfair, unfair commercial practice. And then ensuring that there's international harmonization of these rules, for example, by following models uh, set, um, for example, by the UN One Planet Network's guidelines for providing product sustainability information. We have three supporting actions which are vital to creating that further ecosystem for change. We've already heard uh, from Kelson about the importance of promoting consumer education and awareness, especially in the context of a next generation of consumers who are willing to make changes if they are informed about how to do that and how to, emphasize, uh, how to prioritize their actions. Enforcement is a key issue that we've been hearing in our stakeholder consultations from consumer authorities, especially regarding uh, green claims and enforcing rules uh, on misleading claims. And then it's key for there to be a coherent policy framework on sustainable consumption. SDG 12 on sustainable consumption and production is the least funded SDG. Only 82 uh, countries by 2020 had introduced policy frameworks on sustainable consumption and production. So we want to make recommendations on how there can be interagency consultation, coordination, and international cooperation that ensures that we build that coherent policy framework on sustainable consumption. Next steps, it would be fantastic to have uh, the audience's participation in our project as we finalize. So we've, with IISD, we're finalizing a full policy toolkit uh, which elaborates these policy actions and provides guidelines on implementation. And we're currently co conducting a peer review of this, which will run into the 20th of June. So if you would like to be part of that, please get in touch um, and we can invite you to do that. We're also looking to launch a green commerce task force, uh, which will champion the implementation of these actions. So we'll also get in touch if you want to join this campaign, uh, because these are priority actions. And finally, we're looking especially next at the, how technology and technological advances are really changing the game um, in terms of business practice. So if you have a vision of a future online marketplace that is different from ours, or if you have ideas and examples to share, uh, especially on how tech-enabled solutions are changing the game, we'd be very glad to hear from you on that. But on that, I'll stop sharing my screen and pass back to you, Helena, so we can hear from our consumer advocates. Brilliant. So we recognize we've gone from the very, very big picture to a very specific individual place, but this is where the rubber hits the road. Uh, we need to get things like this uh, moving um, forward. Uh, so Natalie, thank you for helping with your team um, and driving this piece of uh, analysis and, and set of recommendations. Why in your view is this so important? Um, and uh, you know, how do we, um, which of these do you think is, uh, is perhaps the, the first step to take? Yeah, thank you very much, Elena, and uh, hello everyone. Um, and like you, Helena, and your team, um, I'm also joining uh, this, uh, this discussion from Stockholm, uh, where we're all celebrating 50 years of multilateral environmental action. Um, and so let me just start by saying that it was a real privilege uh, for us at ISD to work with Consumers International on this extremely timely and very important project on e-commerce platforms and sustainability. So the huge growth, as you said, of e-commerce and the change of consumer habits 
um, really present you know, both challenges and opportunities. E-platforms contribute to overconsumption and increased waste, for example, but they also provide real new opportunities for consumer empowerment. Um, E-commerce platforms have the potential to provide consumers with the information they need to make sustainable choices and to increase uh, consumer awareness. And compared to more traditional ways of buying in shops, the opportunity for e-commerce platforms to guide consumers towards more sustainable choices is really enormous. Um, and this is not just in relation to the sheer number of goods and services featuring on platforms, but also the consumer's interaction with the screen as opposed to the consumer's position in the shop. So if we think about you know, how sustainability information is conveyed in a shop through individual product labels and product information in small scripts somewhere on the product packaging or the product itself, it's, it's hard to, it's really hard work to access that information and very different from the way we can access information on a screen. Because here, all of us know that information can be easily standardized, bundled and clearly displayed as we already heard from Oliver. So it's really with this in mind that ISD has been collaborating with Consumers International to develop this toolkit of policy actions to improve uh, consumer sustainability information in e-commerce. Now, it, it wasn't an easy task, as you may have seen in the, in the presentation, it's very multifaceted because addressing product sustainability information in online settings really requires action in various different policy areas. So this includes policies and requirements on product sustainability information, on consumer protection, on digital policies. And all of these policy areas need to be brought together in a more comprehensive way. And this is how we will be the most effective. So with this as background, our toolkit, I think, uh, sets out a number of potential policy actions ranging from, as we heard, product sustainability information across value chains, more accessible and streamlined, to strengthening the reliability of eco-labels and combating uh, misleading green claims. So there's a lot of work ahead to empower and influence sustainable consumer behavior on e-commerce platforms. And we hope that the toolkit that we jointly developed uh, will be an important milestone in this journey. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity, Helena, to, to speak here and join you. Thank you. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. And yeah, we absolutely recognize, anybody in this space recognizes it's not as simple uh, as you might think to create demand or to you know, create that engagement with consumers and the lack of coherence, you know, putting things together takes uh, a, a good deal of effort. Kelson, you raised how do we um, make sure that the next generation has the information you need. As you look at these recommendations in your setting in Hong Kong, is this something that you feel uh, is coherent, is strong enough to make a change? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone again. I'm Kelson, and I'm here to share with you guys my thoughts on why it is important to enhance the information transparency about sustainability in e-commerce from a youth perspective. And yeah, um, nowadays, I think everyone knows that um, young consumers are increasingly concerned about sustainability. For example, um, in the Sustainable Consumption Report published by the Hong Kong Consumer Council last year, we found that Generation Z are more likely and tend more to purchase environmentally friendly products more, more often than the other age groups, which is a significant difference. And while e-commerce is getting popular, there are also environmental issues induced. Uh, we know that the growth of e-commerce is like a surge, but behind the growth, we can imagine the impact on the environment has intensified throughout the whole product, uh, the whole product life cycle, including production, uh, from production to transportation, to packaging, to usage, et cetera. And, and even though when, even when we are more environmentally conscious, it is hard to prevent the issue because as an individual, our voices are hardly heard. 
And also nowadays, we might still like ways to distinguish um, green traders and non-green traders, especially given the practice of uh, greenwashing, as you know, Oliver just mentioned. And as a result, we might not be able to turn our thoughts into action. And that's why um, CR's proposal of enhancing sustainability information transparency could be a solution. Uh, for, for, for example, if we have an evident labeling or a passport system that provide accessible information to young consumer, then we can identify green products easier. And second, um, this kind of action is easy to do and viable as we can just make decision uh, simply after, make, after reading the product information. And it also brings tangible benefits uh, to young consumer. It not only fulfill our pursuit of sustainability, but also protect the environment just eventually. And uh, it's also about the reason why we need uh, international consumer organization because um, the voices of consumer could be gather and hence be louder so that uh, different governments could likely would likely take it more seriously when when it comes to the proposal of enhancing transparency um, so I would say nowadays uh, just just like Oliver just gave some example in France in EU uh, we know that different places or international organizations have already had some similar policies in place. For example, I can give you some uh, examples in, 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 in Asia, like in, in South Korea, there is also the Env Environment Technology and Industry Support Act that provide a legal basis for to punish false eco-labels. And also in Singapore, there is a local uh, scheme for products with reduced packaging and that will help consumer distinguish products as well. And also in Hong Kong, we have the energy efficiency labeling scheme, which aims to encourage consumer to purchase home appliances that are less energy consuming. So I think uh, based with reference to this kind of policy, we can extend the information sustainability, not just at the not just at the physical store, but also to the online world, which is uh, getting popular. And I think uh, different governments just could learn from these policies and build a better trans, uh, transparency requirements, you know, apply to the online world. And eventually sustainability means meeting our needs currently without sacrificing the needs of the next generation. And as a part of the next generation, I reckon it important to make e-commerce more sustainable just to just by enhancing the transparency of information. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Kelson. Thank you. I really appreciate um, your leaning in with um, uh, the voice of those who are going to be in this marketplace. Paul, can I come to you next? Your reactions as you see these policy uh, or, or action steps, uh, do you feel they're relevant, coherent, helpful for all of us as consumer advocates around the world? Lynn, I think um, it's very relevant, but um, Kaysen just now shared about a generation who probably are already convinced you know, about sustainable issues. You know? And for them, this step is just to make sure, it makes it easy, like so-called nudging behavior. But I'd like to also talk about the broader uh, role of consumers, and I'm talking of all consumers, differing economies, different perception of uh, climate change and sustainable consumption issues. I mean, for example, in Malaysia now, we are going through a heat wave. Everybody knows it's climate change. We just had uh, flooding, which was also related with climate change. But the issue is increasing food prices. You know, that dominates, that dominates the issue because that's what closes to us. But having said that, we still have to bring sustainable consumption and production as a priority agenda. And I think that's missing, and that's missing. So if you have all the other things, you, you are well aware, you're motivated, the policy helps because it makes it easy for you to make decision. It provides information. But if it's not, I think our greater role is not just this group, but all groups, you know, everyone. And then someone had mentioned whether it's the poor, whether it's we have to get them. It's not just about the millennials doing the right thing, but it's about everybody doing the right thing. And I think that's tough. I think that's tough. But I think that should be our role. I mean, as consumer organizations. So there's a regulatory role in terms of continuous messaging. We need to build that commitment that, that you know, we want to save the planet. We want to we are willing to change that behavior. If not, you know, all of these things are not going to work. 
even if labeling, I think it's it's the final thing where you know consumers. But will consumers want to you know make that change? Number two, will they even understand? You know, for example, we talk of health health uh, labeling, so much of information. But yet, as consumer organizations, we fought for traffic light. So that it's easy to understand. And with that understanding, we can make decision. So similarly, that's with the motivation, the urgency, you know. For example, in Malaysia, I feel that there's no urgency. There's a bit here and a bit there, you know, about climate change, but there's no urgency. Urgency will create the motivation, not just knowledge, the motivation that, you know, something needs to be done, that this problem has been created by humans more than ever. I mean, that's what the report shows, and that it can also change. And then once we reach that level, uh, then comes the technicalities of whether it's uh, equal labeling, whether it's uh, online commerce or whatever, you know. But I, I think for, for nations, uh, this, this for developing nations at least, this has to be the priority to get everybody into the game. And um, I think one of the powerful projects that CI did, for example, in India, was to get poor people to change behavior. You know, it's not about, and, and I think the struggle for consumer organizations where very often sustainable consumption is not the priority uh, is, is to bring everyone into the game. As consumer organizations had mentioned earlier, our role is to influence policy, to influence the implementation of that policy, and of course, to empower consumers, both in terms of behavioral change, as well as put pressure on the government, you know, to, 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 to educate, to help them understand equal labels and what other ways that they can you know, to bring along into that direction of, of behavioral change for better uh, sustainability. Uh, those are my thoughts, uh, Helena. Thank you so much. And I think our emphasis on e-commerce is one in recognition of Joy Ashery's point that, you know, there are some who are perhaps more likely to be shopping online where action needs to be taken uh, even more and there is even greater responsibility and also the growing phenomenon of e-commerce, because this is happening around the world. Um, and so we, we're attempting to find those intervention points where we can actually make a difference. But this is one of many in the constellation, of course. Um, Jan, I'd love your reaction to the, the specific policy or, or actions for all of us, really, that were, were highlighted in this particular piece of work. Thoughts? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. I, I found the, uh, the report very interesting and I'm very happy that you produced it <laughs> because uh, it's been too little focus on, on the uh, e-commerce e role. And, and I agree completely with, with most what was what, said and the conclusions in, in the report. And, and e-commerce has definitely a potential to more in, influence consumer behavior to, to uh, uh, go more into this sustainability road, so to speak. Um, it's it's actually so we have an example from my organization we just recently released a, a report on organic food on on e-commerce on uh, when you shop organic food on on um, the internet and and our findings was that it was uh, more organic food there than in ordinary shops but there were uh, big differences between product categories and for instance milk was much easier to find than cheese and and it's almost the same product and uh, this report ended up with some recommendations to the retail e-retailers e about filtering using algorithms much more uh, have bonuses for sustainable purchases um, uh, more campaigning who have more info information about the advantages about buying organic food and so on. So there is a lot they actually can do themselves without policy actions, but, but uh, there's a need for policy actions as well, but they can really be front runners. Uh, they have the means, they, there are, you know, books written and universities specialized on marketing and influence consumers in making, specific choices out there so so they, they can use them in a in a good sense really um, about the the five policy actions uh, i can just comment a few there about encourage of, of course sustainable behavior that's we need more of nudge and we we need more of of visible practices how how can you actually act uh, 
Uh, and I'm, I'm uh, involved in a research program here in Sweden that's called Mistra Sustainable Consumption that I, I re can really rec recommend you. I, I, I can send the link later. And, and they have the, the motto from niche to mainstream. Uh, and that really uh, captures the, the, um, uh, what's, what's needed. Uh, when it comes to eco-labels, they are very important. I will comment that as well, uh, very briefly. Uh, but we have to avoid a jungle, so to speak, of, of eco-labels. And, and uh, the labels should really make it easier for, for consumer, uh, balance all, all the conflicts of interest that are, are in there. And of course, they have to be a third party certified. Um, and and uh, if retailers start to invent different logos that maybe look like, like uh, eco labels, that will definitely not help the consumer, which leads us in, into the, the, um, the issue of, of, of greenwashing. And we can really see an inflation now of, of greenwashing. Uh, and it's, it's more and more tempting, of course, since you have to be sustainable or at least uh, look be perceived as, as sustainable as a company. It, it's very much about the branding of, of, of the company, especially now it's about carbon neutral and carbon positive and those. So we need, really need strict rules and uh, what's also in the, the uh, supporting action, the enforcement. Uh, we cannot emphasize the enforcement good enough uh, uh, or because it's not enough with rules, you have to have tools and resources to the enforcement agencies so they can really do a job and, and do it both in the real life and in the digital life, so to say. And they also have to have higher sanctions. That's also key, uh, that to be able to really make changes uh, that have been too soft, at least here in Sweden, I, I can say. And then capacity building is also a supporting action. And, and of course, that's all always capacity building, education, awareness raising. And that's where we as a civil society and consumer movement has a very important role to play to make this understandable, as I started uh, off with. Um, the sustainable consumption must be a much more uh, important part in, in the curriculum uh, of, of of the schools, but also all groups of consumer, all ages must really uh, get the chance to learn how, how can I, in an easy way, without uh, spending too much time, consume um, uh, in a sustainable way. So, but uh, as I said earlier, it's not knowledge alone, it's not information alone, it must be supported by policy actions and brave companies. Excellent, thank you, Jan. I know um, this is uh, just a, a very specific part of the systems you talked about, uh, Christiane and Isabel, but maybe, and we're only starting the sort of uh, reflection on uh, the, the actions that we've, we've, we've shared with you here. Um, any, any guidance you can give us, any reactions that you would share just as you look at those five uh, key points on a specific area of how uh, we bring consumers into a sustainable economy, if you wish. Isabel, perhaps you'd like to go first. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so thank you for what I heard. Um, it's true that we have to influence the behavior and the behavior of the consumer is very different regarding where you are, which are your revenue, your level of education, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I think that what is, could be important for organization for consumer is we to create alliances, alliances and even unexpected alliances. I mean, a, a person, a man, a woman, uh, a young, uh, a youth is not only a consumer. He is also a citizen, a parent, uh, uh, somebody which, has, which is not only purchasing, but uh, doing a lot of things. And I think that take the, the, the angle of the person and not only of the citizen and not only the consumer is also a way 
to system to systemize the the the, the, the approach between digitally uh, and digital platforms, green issues, but also all other issues. So I think that alliance is important, and just the federation of the consumer organization is important, but create bridges with other organization, other civil society actors, parliament, uh, private sector. Uh, is also very important to increase or to uh, elevate the level of awareness uh, regarding the way to purchase, but also the way to travel, the way to educate your children, the way to, the, the way to do a lot of things in your life <laughs> in order to really, uh, adapt your behavior. So that's just alliances. It, I think, something which is, could be key regarding the specific situation of each country. And I really appreciate uh, our African friends uh, speaking about Africa. It's true that it's totally different. And culturally, the alliances will be totally different in those countries, for sure. Uh, but it has to be done on ground level. They are the best in the best place to identify who are the partners locally or, or, or nationally, which are important to a certain extent or to a certain issue or regarding actuality, election. I don't know all the facts which could happen in the country and why it's important that the voice of the organization could be heard. Perfect. I think, thank you so much. I think we may have, uh, yeah, Joy Ashri, can I come back to you? We've, we've started out with the, the powerful role, the importance of demand side strategies. We've had this discussion, we've gone into e-commerce as an example of where we can take action. Um, what's your uh, sense of the conversation and you, you know, how you see uh, the way in which uh, consumer experts, consumer advocates, those who are driving consumer uh, protection and empowerment can lean in uh, and work together with uh, those who are uh, seeing and, and sharing the science um, uh, and evidence of the change we're going through. I think this is extremely important and I'm really so happy to be part of this whole conversation. Uh, there are two things which I want to say is that because when we were working through the report, we found that there are studies which are showing that uh, the e-commerce the supply chain really needs to be understood better and make it sustainable because packaging is increasing. So there are many other things which are increasing. And sometimes I think we've just lost a uh, connection there. Joy Ashri, can you still hear us? I'm, I'm sorry, I just lost in between, yeah. So what I just want to say is that, so what also we saw was that sometimes e-commerce, especially during pandemic, some of the studies showed that actually the, there is something which we call rebound effect because now people are thinking that they are getting sustainable products so that the total product demand increased. So basically, this is uh, um, something which we really need to look into that the consumers thinking that they are consuming sustainably, their total consumption is increasing. So basically the pro total product demand is going up. So that is also something very important which we need to, uh, um, I mean, educate the consumers. So this is uh, something which is extremely important. Second thing is that because of the e-commerce, unless there is policy, we found very clearly that it is uh, difficult to say whether digitization will actually lead to uh, reduction in emission because, because of several reasons which have come up in, in the whole discussion. So this is extremely important how science and uh, these, um, I mean, the advocacy group and the policy and the consumer group, consumer awareness programs, they really uh, build in those uh, uh, restrictive elements which brings in sustainable consumption without leading to, I mean, more consumption increase. And also that the digital platform, how you use that will also show that how your overall energy consumption is going to go up or not. So that also needs to be checked and balanced. So I think there are several issues for digitization. We could not come to a conclusion that whether this will be really, um, I mean, emission reducing or not. So that was one of the major conclusion that we came up with. So I think there is 
enough research really needs to go into that, how to make it, um, I mean, emission reducing as well as sustainable consumption and not leading to a higher level of consumption of products. Indeed. So further work for us uh, together, Natalie. Fantastic. So um, we're at a critical moment. Um, the role of consumers is powerful. Uh, consumers can be provided with the right information and empowered both in traditional markets and online, but must be supported. And there is a heck of a lot of work uh, to do, which will involve us working with unusual partners and across uh, silos. Um, as Ollie described, uh, we are open uh, to hearing feedback on the specific recommendations that you've heard here today, um, but more importantly, on the crucial journey ahead. Uh, so that we reach a uh, future model of economy uh, of sustainable consumption and production that actually includes, that uh, is safe, that is fair for all of us around the world. And um, we believe that consumer advocates can play a crucial role in that. Thank you so much to our panelists uh, for sharing their perspectives and insights today from around the world. Thank you to uh, all of you for joining um, and listening here today. Um, stay well, stay safe, and see you soon. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you.